welcome back to another edition of Coexist. This is a, uh, a concept that I created. It's conversation for conservation. And I can't even tell you right now how thrilled and excited I am to have the one and only Captain Paul Watson as my special guest for the hour. And uh, Paul, before we start, I have to tell you, I was talking to a few people and I said, I think I might be getting Captain Paul Watson on the show. And they literally like practically leapt over the table. They were so excited that you were going to be on the show. So thank you uh, for making time for us. And I know how busy you are saving the world and protecting the ocean and really thrilled to have you here. How are things in Vermont for you right now? Oh, everything's uh, fine. It's nice and quiet here. Vermont's pr probably the safest state in the country right now. I would imagine so. I would imagine so. And with COVID going on, it's it's been an interesting 2020 for sure. So um, just to introduce you to the concept of the show, this show was created to raise awareness for other great organizations and people around the world. I have an anti-poaching foundation based in Zambia. So I'm very empathetic with other people who have organizations, people out there trying to fight the good fight, you know, raise awareness. I'm kind of worried about some organizations not surviving COVID, obviously for financial reasons and awareness reasons. So any way that I can bring light and awareness to great people and great groups, that's the whole purpose of this, this hour and this show. And, you know, when I was, reading up and you know everybody around the world knows you and your amazing work but when i was kind of digging into everything that you achieved i have to laugh because after i went through like my first hour of it i thought i feel like i've achieved nothing in life look at what this guy has done in his decades on this planet trying to affect change and having it come from the right place in his soul and you know you you start you you started off your activism in the 60s going against nuclear testing you carried on you were in the coast guard obviously you have a passion for the sea co-founder of greenpeace founder of sea shepherd in all this time and here we are in 2020 we're going to take a look at the world and the state of the oceans and the seas as they are right now but let's learn a little bit about you. What, when did the connect with protecting wildlife happen with you? At what age? Was there a, an epiphany? Like, where, where did this all come from? Well, when I was 10 years old, uh, you know, I was raised in eastern Canada. So uh, when I was 10, I spent the whole summer uh, swimming with a family of uh, beavers. And uh, wonderful. And next year, when I went back the next summer, uh, they're all gone. And uh, I began to ask questions, found out trappers had taken them all during the winter time. So that made me really quite angry. So when uh, that winter, when I was 11, I uh, began to walk the trap lines and uh, release the animals and destroyed the traps. And I guess I've been doing every, the, the same thing ever since for the last 60 years. I always find that talking to people in this field, that there is this moment where something clicks and they're like, I just can't watch it happen. I have to do something about it. And I think why you resonate with myself and so many other people is that not only did you identify an issue going on or multiple issues, you actually acted upon it and, and thought, you know what, I'm going to alter my life dramatically to create change. So, so back up. So you're, you're younger, you, you're in the Sierra club, you're protesting, you, you feel like you have this activist feeling you want to be a caretaker of the world when you were in the coast guard did that did you have a passion for the sea already or did that encourage your passion for the sea well i was raised in an eastern canadian fishing village so i was mm -hmm. right in the sea and i ran off to uh when i was 16 i ran off and joined the um, norwegian merchant marine and uh then after that i was in the canadian coast guard and at the same time i was working my way uh, through university. But in 1969, there was a demonstration on the Canadian-U.S. border against uh, nuclear testing at Amchik Island in the Aleutians. And the uh, demonstration was brought together by two groups, the Quakers and uh, the Sierra Club. I was a member of the Sierra Club at the time. And uh, at that, from that demonstration, we decided to have a meeting and discuss what we could do. And the Quakers brought up the fact that in 1956, they had sent a boat down to protest the nuclear testing in the South Pacific 
uh, at Bikini Island. And uh, so we decided, okay, well, let's, let's get a boat and go up to Amchitka and do the, do the same thing. Uh, so we set up a group called, uh, we called it the Don't Make a Wave Committee because uh, the, uh, the Anchorage earthquake was still in people's minds and the tsunami that hit Hawaii and Vancouver Island. And we were trying to put that image into people's heads that, you know, nuclear testing could cause another earthquake. But uh, at one of the early meetings, uh, somebody left and flashed a peace sign. And uh, Bill Darnell, who was uh, one of our first crew members, he said, uh, make that a, a green piece. And um, Bob Hunter said, hey, that's a great name for the boat. So we'll call the boat the, the green piece. And so it was a green piece. And there's two boats and the green piece, too. I sailed on the green piece, too. And um, in 1972, we officially changed the name of the Don't Make a Wave Committee to the, to the Greenpeace Foundation. And then I, I left Greenpeace in 77 to set up Sea Shepherd. And the reason I left was that I, I just find protesting to be ineffectual. And um, it's sort of like, please, please, please don't kill the whales or please don't do that. They do it anyway. And, you know, and, and, all, and, and people who perform dis civil disobedience end up ruining their life with a criminal record or something like that. So I decided, look, you know, we, we've got to be more active. And so I set a Sea Shepherd up to intervene. So Sea Shepherds is a marine wildlife uh, anti-poaching organization, conservation organization. That's what we do. We oppose illegal activities. And we've been doing that for 42 years now. And when I set it up, I also set up this uh, strategy, which I call aggressive nonviolence. And uh, we're going to be as aggressive as we possibly can, but we're not going to hurt anybody. And after 42 years, we've never caused a single injury to a single person, but we have shut down hundreds of illegal activities. And I like that because in the early in the early time of Sea Shepherd, you know, you kind of you guys were considered kind of controversial, like because nobody had seen anything like this before. Like you said, people are like putting up signs, you know, don't kill the whales or save Earth. But there wasn't much behind that. I mean, you can talk all day long, but some people just aren't going to change and you have to get their attention and you have to bring awareness so you guys had uh, kind of one view, and then you kind of with time and with um, maybe wisdom and experience, you kind of shifted, like you said, to becoming a, a, a law enforcement kind of entity on the waters. Because something amazed me that I was reading, and it was a federal judge who said, you know, that UN charter, you know, the nature charter that they had come up with, a federal judge said, how is anybody going to enforce this exactly? And that's really discouraging. Like you got the entity of the UN coming up with something to try to protect wildlife and stop illegal activity. But unless you have an enforcement contingency, what good is it? It's just on, on paper. So I love the direction that Sea Shepherd said, you know what? We're going to stop the illegal activity out there. We are watching you. We know what you're doing. So don't think you're getting a free pass out there whaling or, you know, going into certain beds that you shouldn't be in or attacking coral reefs, whatever. So I love that you guys have taken that on. And another thing that resonated with me was the line. And I think one of your teammates said, are you willing to give up your life to save the life of a whale. And I think for us, a lot of us in the world right now, a lot of us can say that very clearly. Yeah. And, and not even think about it. You know, this is where we have been pushed to in trying to stop extinction, overfishing, just the, the raping and pillaging of the planet. So I think what you guys have done by, you know, working with the governments and stuff is fantastic. Well, in the beginning, we didn't, of course, but, but you can't, uh, you, you know, poachers don't listen to protest signs and they don't listen to petitions and they certainly don't listen to the law. So we did have to take it into our own hands. And that has evolved over the years so that we're now working in partnership with governments around the world. Uh, we provide the uh, the vessels and the volunteers, they, they provide the enforcement and, and that's working out quite well. And we're in partnership with numerous African and Latin American countries now. Now, one of the things when I was getting volunteers in the beginning, you know, one of the questions I would ask them is, are you willing to risk your life to protect a whale? And if they said no, then we didn't want them. And when people said, well, that's a, asking people, a, you know, it's pretty unreasonable to ask people that. I said, well, why is that? Uh, we ask young people to not only risk their life, but to kill people in order to protect real, real estate, oil wells and flags and religion. 
I think it's a far more noble pursuit to uh, risk your life to protect an endangered species or a threatened habitat. It's just a matter of values, really. And yeah. uh, so Sea Shepherd wouldn't be anything without the thousands and thousands of volunteers over the years who have, um, you know, involved uh, through, um, who are motivated by passion. And I've always said that the three virtues that change the world are passion, courage, and imagination. And these are the, the kind of people that we're always looking for. And they're the kind of people that change the world. Yeah. And, and that is the, th that's the interesting thing is the ones, you know, uh, what was the line? Um, if you're, you know, if you've got to make, create waves, you know, you got to rock the boat basically to get people's attention. I mean, that is the way you can affect change because like we said, you can talk all day long, but it's, it's not going to work anymore. And we've been waiting, you know, a lot of people want to do the proper way and not offend everybody, you know, try to get the message across peacefully, but we're running out of time. You know, we're running out of time on land in the, in the sea. And you have to have people with the drive and a passion who put something else in front of their life and commit that, you know, and that's what it seems like with Sea Shepherd. Like when you are vetting people to come on board, you got to make sure you guys are all on the same page, like the same common vision. Yes, and it's very important uh, to use your imagination to come up with tactics to get around the obstacles that are there. Uh, you know, we live in a, a very violent society, and the only way to deal with that kind of violence is to uh, find strategies that get around it, because we can't be violent. And we can't be violent for practical reasons, because governments have a monopoly on violence. So they, if, you, if you violently interfere with what they're doing, they'll kill you. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah pretty much. So you have to find ways of doing, of being successful and at the same time frustrating the hell out of them because they can't respond violently towards you. And uh, so Sea Shepherd has always acted within the boundaries of both practicality and the law. We've never been convicted of a, of a felony crime in our entire history. And uh, but people call us a lot of names, but that doesn't really bother us. You know, if you're going to change the world, you're going to people are going to call you names. Uh, back in the 90s, when they started calling us pirates, I said, OK, well, we'll be pirates. So <laughs> Let me get a Jolly Roger and fly it up the, the flagpole. So we got our own Jolly Roger. And, uh, you know, because, you know, one of the things that I learned from the history of piracy is they, they got things done. They were way ahead of their time. I mean, I don't know anything that's bad about the pirates, really, when you think about it. Like, for instance, the Pirates of the Caribbean, they uh, had their ships were run democratically. They elected their uh, their captains and their officers. Uh, they were they accepted any crew members, regardless of gender or race. I mean, this is way ahead of their time for the 17th century. And people say, well, what were they were thieves. They were robbers. Yes, they stole gold from the Spanish. And where did the Spanish get it? They stole it from the Indians. So are you really a thief if you're stealing gold from people who stole it from the first place? <laughs> yeah. But they also got things done. They got cut through the bureaucracy. You know, uh, the British Navy didn't shut down piracy in the Caribbean in the 17th century. And the reason being is that uh, so many politicians were on the take. Not much different than the way things are today. Uh, piracy was shut down by Henry Morgan, a pirate. You know, his reward was being made governor of Jamaica. And then he became a real pirate after that. But, uh, the, the, you know, the. The thing is, we can learn a lot uh, from the past. And some of the world's great nautical heroes were pirates. John Paul Jones was a pirate, founder of the United States Navy. Walter Raleigh, Sir, uh, uh, Sir Francis Drake, Roger Sakufa, on and on and on. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot that we can learn from from the pirates. Yeah, I, I get that. You know, so when, when Sea Shepherd started, you started off with, obviously, probably one boat. Was this the, the ship with Cleveland Amory that he had donated or, or bought for you? And how many, how many boats and ships do you guys have now, and how many countries are you working in? Yes, we did. Uh, we started off with the, the Sea Shepherd, which I, I purchased in Great Britain in 78 with um, funds provided by the Fund for Animals and the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. I always thought it was really uh, ironic that uh, the two most conservative animal groups in the, at the time were funding the, you know, our so-called radical approach. Um, but now today we have nine ships and uh, that's growing every year. Uh, probably about right now, a couple hundred volunteers on those ships. Uh, we have two ships right off of Africa right now, opposing poachers, uh, vessels in the Sea of uh, Cortez protecting the endangered vaquita. We have a crew up in the Faroe Islands now protecting uh, dolphins. 
and uh, we're doing anti-poaching campaigns in the Mediterranean right now. So, uh, you know, Sea Shepherd is no longer an organization. It's evolved into a, a movement, an international movement, and 42 different countries. And so what, what's great about that is uh, two things. One is that we can do so many things. I can't even keep track of all of the yeah. things we're doing. And the other thing is that, you know, you can stop an individual like myself, and you can shut down an organization, but you can't shut down a movement. And that's our strength. Do you look back and think like, wow, how how did this all come about? Something that you loved, you loved animals. And do you look back and think, how did how did I get Sea Shepherd going? I mean, it's a huge operation. There are a lot of moving parts. Um, you guys have gone up against countries, you know, Japan not being your best friend or a lot of people's not best friend. But I mean, do you kind of look back like, wow, how how did I pull this off. I mean, I know it's a lot of people doing it, but do you have moments like, wow, like, look at this, look what's happened? Well, I guess the secret's in delegation. Uh, you know, Sea Shepherd, uh, you know, is run by its captains, its officers, its directors. Uh, I mean, if I had to do all this, uh, nothing to get done, really. So um, that kind of um, diversity is what has made us uh, made us effective. And you are an award winner, and uh, rightfully so. You've uh, been voted Time Magazine's top, in the top 20 environmentalists. You got a Distinguished Service Medal from Liberia, an Amazon Peace Prize. You know, uh, the recognition of your work, you know, it, at times people might think you're controversial or too aggressive or whatever, but when the dust settles and people look at the accomplishment accomplishments that you've made, you've raised the awareness. And I kind of liken you to the voice of the ocean, like you were able to translate the pain of what was going on in the ocean and make it understandable for man, like making the connect, which is so powerful and so potent. I, I, I do look at you like the voice of the ocean. I love the ocean. Um, I'm not as experienced and I don't know as much about the ocean as I do say the animals going on in Africa right now, but you've made me aware, you, you know, you have TV shows, whale wars, you've got documentaries, there's many publications on you. And that's a, a, a very uh, important, you know, thing that you are to so many people because you do connect the dots for people like, why should I care about whaling or why should I care about the vaquita? I mean, what, what, how does this impact me? And you're connecting those dots for people as to the importance of it, why we need to protect them and why this is happening right now and what we can do to undo it. So that is a, you've got a big role. It's a, it's a big mantle on your shoulders and um, it, it's something that, I probably in my lifetime won't meet five other people who carry a, a, such a huge mantle of a, a specific thing in the world. And I think it's, it's pretty amazing that you persevere. And so let me ask you this. So decades now of you doing this and seeing what's happened in the world, are things improving? Are things worse? Are they status quo? How are you feeling overall right now? As far as awareness is concerned, it's far, far better. People are far more aware now than ever before. But the situation becomes more and more desperate. Uh, uh, there's a combination of so many things, overfishing, illegal fishing, uh, plastic pollution, acidification, climate change, on and on. Uh, uh, to be blunt, the, the sea is dying. And uh, as I say all the time, the sea or as the ocean dies, we die because we don't live on this uh, on this planet with the dead ocean. One of the things I've been trying to get across is an understanding, what is the ocean? Um, you know, our general uh, understanding is that it's the sea, but it isn't just the sea. The ocean is the planet. This is a planet ocean. It's water in continuous circulation. Sometimes it's in the sea, sometimes it's locked in ice, sometimes it's underground, sometimes it's in the clouds, and, sometimes, and it's always in every single uh, cell of every plant and animal on this planet constantly in circulation. So the water in your body right now is once in the sea, once in the ice, once in the clouds, and it's constantly in circulation. So it's all interconnected. 
And uh, when we impact one part of it, we impact uh, the another part of it. Because the three basic laws of ecology are, one, the law of diversity, that the strength of an ecosystem is dependent upon diversity within it. The second is the law of interdependence, that all those species are interdependent with each other. And third is the law of finite resources, that there's a limit to growth and a limit to carrying capacity. And what we're doing is stealing the carrying capacity of other species for our numbers and our wealth to grow. And that's causing um, a diminishment in both diversity and interdependence. I guess the best way, if you look on this planet, in the same way as uh, you would look on a spaceship, which is what we are. We're on this incredible voyage around the Milky Way galaxy. And every spaceship has a, a life support system, which provides us with everything we need. The, the air we breathe, the food we eat, regulates climate and temperature. And that life support system is run by a crew on this spaceship Earth. And not us. Uh, we humans, we're just, we're passengers. We're having a wonderful time amusing and entertaining ourselves. But what we're doing is killing off crew members. And there's only so many crew members you can kill off before the machinery begins to fall apart. 70% of the air we breathe is manufactured by phytoplankton in our ocean. And there's been a 40% diminishment in phytoplankton population since 1950. If phytoplankton disappears in the ocean, we all die. It's as simple as that. That's how closely connected we are. And what keeps phytoplankton healthy? Whales. Whales bring up carbon from the depths and they uh, spread it out in manure on the surface. One blue whale defecates every day about three tons, very rich in nitrogen and iron. Those are the primary nutrients required by phytoplankton. The whales, in fact, are the farmers of the ocean. The more healthy the whale population, the healthier the phytoplankton population. The healthier the phytoplankton population, the healthier the fish and everything that goes up from there. So unfortunately, we tend to view the world from an anthropocentric point of view, which is all about us. Everything surrounds us. It's about us. There's nothing that's more important than us. When in fact, the reality is that we live in a biocentric world. We're part of everything. And unless we learn to live in harmony with other species, we're not going to survive. Yeah. Apparently, we're not doing a very good job right now. If it's all about us, we're failing bad, you know, miserably right now. But it was funny that you mentioned that about the whales, because I liken it to the elephants. The elephants are the architect of of land, of the continent of Africa and over in Asia. They have the same purpose. When you were rattling off what the whale provides for an ocean, same thing over there. You know, when I lived, when I grew up in Africa on a game reserve, my father was a, um, he started a safari camp over there. There were 10 million elephants on the continent of Africa when I lived there. And there are under 300,000 right now. So you can imagine how everything is out of whack in yeah. Africa and in Asia. So so just transfer that to the oceans and what's going on with whaling. And let me ask you about the whaling. Um, where, where does it stand right now? Is Japan still whaling? Is it... Are they doing it legally? Where where does where do countries stand right now in 2020 on whaling? Well, under international rules, all whaling is illegal. But uh, we we've had some incredible successes over the years. When we we began doing what we're doing here back in the early 70s, uh, you know, Australia, Chile, Peru, Spain, all of these countries were were whaling nations. They're not whaling anymore. And last year was the first year that all whaling was shut down in international waters. No whales are being killed in international waters. With Japan's retreat from the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary, which it took us 10 years to get them out of there, but they're gone. Uh, all whaling is now restricted to the territorial waters of Norway, number one, Japan, number two, uh, the Danish Faroe Islands, and Iceland, except though Iceland hasn't killed any whales for the last couple of years, and I think it's over. They haven't announced it, but I think it's over. We're there every year to make sure that they don't. But uh, so whaling right now, I, I, I think, has been 95 percent eradicated. And it's always been my lifelong ambition to do it 100 percent eradication of all whaling activities. And I think we can I think we can achieve that. The real problem today, though, is the destruction of the fishes mm -hmm. over and oh, that yeah. is going to affect everything. And uh, we're literally just taking all life out of the ocean. It's out, it's out of control. There is no sustainable fishery anywhere in the world anymore. These heavy industrialized uh, fishing operations are just strip mining life out from the sea. We need at least a 50-year moratorium, all commercial industrialized fishing. We need the ocean to, we need to give the ocean the time to repair the damage that we've done to it. And unless we do that, well, according to Dr. Boris Worm and Dr. Uh, Daniel Pauly, the two foremost fisheries biologists in the world today, there won't be any fishing industry by 2048 because there won't be there won't be any fish. 
So it just doesn't make any, it's just a complete insanity that we allow yeah. this to go on. But the reason it goes on is this thing called the tragedy of the commons. You know, a fisherman from Russia says, well, if I don't catch it, some Spanish fisherman will. And if a Spanish fisherman doesn't catch it, some, you know, Chilean fisherman, you know, they, they're, they're, they're all trying to compete to take the last fish out of the ocean because they all feel that it's inevitable that it's all going to crash. And so very few people are looking in the future. The big failings of the human species, one is our adaptation to diminishment, which served us well 30,000 years ago, but today is really our undoing uh, because we keep adapting to diminishment over and over and over again. And the other thing is our failure to look ahead into the future to see what, what the consequences are going to be. A good example of uh, adaptation to diminishment to show how, how this comes about is if this is 1965 and I were to say to you, you know, in 40 years, you're going to be buying water in plastic bottles and paying more for that water than the equivalent amount of gasoline. You would have looked at me like, oh, you're insane. Nobody's going to do something. What? That's yeah. And yet here we all do it. We all do it because we've adapted to that diminishment. You know, turbot, which I was, like I said, I was raised in a fishing village. Turbot was considered, uh, unfortunately, a garbage fish. No, it, was, it had no commercial value uh, because there's cod and there's all these other fishes. And, um, so now you go into a restaurant in New York or Paris, if you can find one that's open, uh, and uh, what is, they're, they're serving turbot. I mean, it's, it's actually being served in high class yeah. restaurants. Why? Yeah. Well, we wiped out everything else, so let's do this. I mean, in 30 years, I mean, maybe we'll be sitting down for jellyfish sandwiches. I don't know. But, but it's, Please uh, no. <laughs> it's, a complete, it's, a, it's a constant adaptation to diminishment. And uh, that's just not going to serve as well. And what we have right now are these giant super trawlers that are being built and going out there. And the economics is, I call it the economics of extinction. One of these fishing vessels costs over, what, $200 million to build one vessel. you got to catch a lot of fish just to pay the bank for the loan. So they're under incredible motivation to get as much as they possibly can. One of these super trials, they'll take about two, 300 tons a day out of the ocean. And uh, the ocean just cannot sustain that kind of uh, assault over and over and over again. And also, okay. it's, in their, it's in their interest. It's in their interest to drive species to extinction. They want to do that. I know it sounds ridiculous, but take a look at tuna, for instance, the bluefin tuna, the most expensive fish in the world today. Average bluefin tuna is $75,000 per fish. Some of them sell for over a million dollars. The reason being they've been 90% diminished. Now, Mitsubishi has a 10 to 15 year supply of uh, bluefin tuna in their warehouses right now. They could stop fishing today and supply their market for the next 10 to 15 years, but they won't do it. That would allow the fish to recover. But why won't they do it? Because if the fish begin to recover and the numbers begin to increase, the price of the commodity goes down and the, the price in their warehouses, all those frozen fish go down. Now, if they drive the fish extinct, uh, the bluefin tuna extinct, they're sitting on 10 to 15 years supply of, a, of an irreplaceable species. They can set their own price. And they're not not—they're not fishermen. These are corporations. They're just short-term investment for short-term gain. We'll, uh, you know, we'll catch all these fish right now, get it off, and then we'll invest it into jet planes or something else after that. It doesn't really matter uh, because they, they're, there's really no concept of the value, the, the ecological value of the resources that they're exploiting. I had no idea that was going on. I mean, I, I'm very aware, I think most people of the overfishing in the world, but I had no idea that they're stockpiling it like it's diamonds or gold bars and they're just driving the price up. I like this. This to me is the madness. And I go back again because I've had a problem with Asia in so many ways. My grandparents lived in China um, in the 20s. And I remember growing up hearing stories of how enlightened the country was. And just it was a very enlightened, very Zen country. And you look at right now of the ravaging they're, they're doing of this planet, especially in Africa. I mean, it is, it's just getting colonized. Nobody really wants to call it out, but that's exactly what's going on. They are just, just raping all the resources and the, and the wildlife and everything. I don't know why this part of the world is just consuming with no regard. I don't, I don't get what's happened. Like why, why is this place become like the hell hole for, for any species? I mean, everything is under because of this one area in particular. I don't get it. 
Well, they've taken over where the Europeans left off. The European colonies crashed. The Asian colonies, they are taking over. I guess they learned from the Europeans. Uh, Europe, Europe, Europe is just as ruthless as Asia. I mean, next to China, the world's worst fishing fleet is the Spanish fishing fleet, which, you know, as far as illegal fishing and, and other things that are concerned. Uh, when we're poachers off of Africa today. We're dealing with Chinese. We're also dealing with Spanish. We're also dealing with Russian. There's there's so many uh, foreign tra trawlers that are coming in from all over the world. So it's not just China. You hear more about China, of course, yeah. because oh, Asia. Yeah. Yeah. But it's China's so much bigger and there's so many more people. But the same attitude exists in Europe and the Americas. The same attitude is there. It's just a question of degrees. The other thing about uh, the economics of extinction, when you mentioned elephants, is that I, that's what they're doing with ivory is stockpiling it. The more ivory they can get, the fewer elephants. The fewer elephants, the more valuable the ivory. And if the yeah. elephants think it's a, it's an irreplaceable commodity, a priceless commodity. So there's literally people who are putting ivory into vaults waiting for the extinction of the elephant. You know, to, yeah. so this, this is the economic systems that we live in. Uh, economics are driven by destruction and extinction. And because uh, it's all short term gain and short term investment. The entire Western Canadian fishing fleet has been bought off and is controlled by one man, Jimmy Patterson, who is a used cars dealer, and now he controls everything. And what he wants, he gets. The government gives him everything he wants. That kind of power buys that kind of exploitation, and you know, a green light to do whatever you want. So they're wiping out the herring on the west coast of Canada right now because you know, why do they, they no, not that anybody eats it, but because it provides the food for the domestic salmon on the salmon farms. And also, here's the other problem that we have, is that 40% of all of the fish taken from the ocean isn't eaten by people. It's fed to chickens and to salmon and to pigs. Chickens are eating more uh, fish today than all the world's albatrosses. You know, seals, um, domestic house cats are eating more fish, 2.8 million tons a year, than all the seals in the North Atlantic Ocean. Uh, this is a world out of balance. So if you, if... Paul Watson was ruler of the universe right now. What would be the three things that you would immediately implement on this planet to try to get balance back on the planet? What are your big three for people to be aware of? Well, if I if I had the well, I, I'm never going to have it. But if I did have it, have I would have the wand. Have, You'll have your wand. I would have a. Uh, uh, an absolute moratorium on all industrialized fishing operations in the world's oceans, elimination of uh, plastic as a product uh, completely, and uh, an end to fossil fuels. Those would be the, the three things that I would uh, you know, work, work at getting. Plastic pollution is out of control. I mean, I've been involved with that since 1985. Back in 1985, when we were warning about plastic, everybody, even the environmental groups, were saying, oh, you're wasting your time. I mean, that's such a minor issue, you know, but it isn't. It's not. Nah more plastic in the ocean than fish. It's a major, major problem. And, uh, but, but it took us 20 years to get people to become aware of that, unfortunately. You know, one, no. of, the problems, one of the problems we have is media. Uh, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, Trump goes on about fake news. Well, he's right in one way, it's, but it's not fake news, it's no news. The media covers things they wanna cover in the corporate interests, but they don't cover, you know, the fact that over a thousand environmentalists have been murdered in the last decade. You never hear about that. Uh, major environmental concerns uh, are never in the news. So the real problem is no news, not fake news, but no news, <laughs> because uh, the media is owned by the same corporations that are destroying the planet. Thus, you know, one of the reasons why I started this podcast, again, is to raise awareness. And funny you mentioned the plastics because um, our foundation is Nisefu Wildlife in Zambia. And my co-founder and I immediately started noticing how plastic is creeping in everywhere, the single-use stuff, and it's really getting bad. So we both looked at each other and were like, oh, no, 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 no. We are not going to let this happen to our area that's happening in the rest of the world. So, you know, we've got conservation classes in the, in the schools over there because if you get the children and you get it in their mind of how to be better stewards of the planet, then you've got a chance at improving the future. But it's funny, it really has taken a hold in the past mm, like three, four years. And so we're like, oh no, w you know, we've seen the wreckage over here in the rest of the world of what happens with the plastic. 
we're going to do our very best to stop that madness because once the cow's out of the barn, you can't get it back in. So you're right. So let me ask you, what does what is Sea Shepherd doing about that issue, the pollution and um, plastics issue? What what are you guys doing that we can share the word on? Well, we have hundreds of chapters around the world. And one of the things that chapter people can do because they're not on the ships and everything is they organize uh, beach cleanups. But our, our beach cleanups are a little more aggressive than a lot of uh, your regular beach cleanups. We we have divers go down and pulling, uh, you know, nets and things off the bottom of the, of, the, of the ocean all over the world. We're doing that in the Red Sea, off the coast of Great Britain, uh, off Australia. Uh, we also go to very remote places like northern Australia to beaches that, you know, nobody goes near, but, you know, tur- except turtles. And, and we and we clean those beaches and everything. Last year, we took 40 tons of uh, marine debris off of Cocos Island, about 300 miles off of the coast of uh, Costa Rica. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, I spent time removing island uh, plastic off of islands off in Vanuatu and Tonga and that. So, you know, this is an ongoing thing. I don't I, I'm not saying that that's something that we concentrate as a campaign, but it's what we do every day, you know, and, uh, at every every opportunity. But, uh, you know, of course, we're just scratching the surface because the amount of plastic that is produced and thrown into the ocean every year is just uh, it's it's insane. out of control. You know, I remember the days when I was a child, I could walk the beaches and not see a single piece of plastic covering plastic. We lived in a world without plastic. Uh, and, and, you know, people say, how do we get by without plastic? Well, prior to 1955, we did right, quite well. So I don't see why we can't. Just fine. That, you know. Yeah. You know, and um, interesting you, you talk about that because, yeah, the life before and after. I mean, remember when the pop tops of cans, the pop tops showed up everywhere quickly. They came up with an answer for that. But um, so that's interesting. So, again, my special guest here is Captain Paul Watson of Sea Shepherd. And I, again, I'm thrilled that I'm getting to spend some time with you and, and share your message and, and everything and learning about things like I, I love this show because I'm learning so much from other people. Like I had no idea about cornering the market on on tuna. You know, who who knew <laughs> who knew that was going on? I didn't know there was a big thing for that. So so tell me right now in 2020 in a covid world, what have you guys have you been out out? on the seas? Is it been restricted? Like what's going on in this circumstance? Well, it has been restricted. Our vessel, the Ocean Warrior, has been uh, quarantined in Singapore since February. Hopefully we'll be able to get it out by the end of September. Uh, our vessels off, are operating off of Africa, but that, that involves putting our crew in quarantine for two weeks prior to joining the ship. Like for instance, they joined the ship in, uh, in the Canary Islands. And so we had to put them in hotels for, for two weeks prior to joining the ships. So it's it's inconvenient, but we're still out there. We're still doing it. We have a uh, nine ships that are operating, and uh, but we you know we have to be very cognizant uh, of the threats, and we're going to have to continue to be cognizant because, you know, for twenty years I've been talking about uh, diminishment in the in eco- ecosystems diminishment and the and the consequences of that. One of the consequences, which I've been saying for years, is the emergence of new pathogens uh, from two po- two two sources. One. Uh, melting permafrost, which is releasing pathogens that have been dormant for 40, 50,000 years. And the other is uh, destruction of ecosystems, which causes genomic transmission of viruses from other species uh, into other species. Now, you know, most people I don't think really understand the world that we live in is actually run by viruses, hundreds of millions of them. Every species, plant and animal has a virus or a group of viruses that are associated with them. We have our own, you know, the dandelion has its own, whatever. Uh, And when you diminish an ecosystem so that a species has been severely diminished, the virus associated with that species has to have some place to go. And it's going to look for a new host. And uh, the ones that are closestly related to us, for instance, whether it be bats or whether it be uh, primates or whatever, they're going to jump on us. We're eight billion, uh, you know, eight billion animals on the hoof around here. I mean, this is pretty attractive if you're a, a virus. I'm not saying that they can think or anything, but that's the way it works. And um, now it's not in the interest of a virus to kill the host, but it has to. There has to be a, a, a coexistence, and that takes time. And a lot of hosts die during that uh, period of, of trying to arrange a coexistence between the virus and everything. And so we incorporate those viruses. Like the, the common cold, that, that, that came from horses. 
well, we incorporated it. We, we, we learned to do, it coexist with it. Uh, you know, different flus, different things, all of these come from viruses. But over the last 10 years, we've had Handa virus, West Nile virus, oh, yeah. uh, so many things that have emerged. COVID is, uh, is probably the worst of that line, but it's not going to be the last. And no, it won't be the last unless unless things change in these open markets and the wet markets and all that, because the zoonotic people don't realize that animals are jammed into cages and in these unsanitary conditions and they're under stress. So mucus and everything is spreading. This is not the last pandemic. You are absolutely right on that one. And it's not just the wet markets. It's not just the factory farms. It's the destruction of, of ecosystems. Uh, True. And that, that's a real problem, I think. Uh, but, you know, our factory farms are no different than Chinese wet markets, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then and no, and people aren't really aware of the number of millions of animals on factory farms every year that are killed because, you know, in the efforts to control these uh, viruses. You know, this is a thing that's been spreading like wildfire through these farms for, for decades. And the, and the solution has been mass eradication, uh, you know, just execution of everything, you know, whether it be a million chickens here or whatever like that, to keep it from spreading, to keep it from going under control. It's a constant war uh, to, to stop that. And, you know, we kill 65 billion animals every year on factory farms. Uh, uh, and, and in, in addition to these other problems, it's a major source of groundwater pollution. It's a major source of dead zones in the ocean. Uh, and it's it's a major contributor to uh, to greenhouse gases more so than the transportation industry, and uh, so you know when we look at the numbers eight billion plus growing, we have to seriously look at alternative ways of uh, of uh, subsistence of you know how to survive because we can't continue. There is no room on this planet for eight billion meat eating primates. You know? Thank you. I mean, and again, going back to what you just said, I just want people to to understand this. 65 billion with a B animals per year. Yeah. What That's gives us the right to do good. that? You know, what gives us the right to just sit there yeah. and determine their fate in such a, a hideous way? I, it just, it keeps me up at night because people are so cavalier ab about the whole thing and, and factory farming. I'm like, you have no idea what a hell hole these places are and that we're subjecting animals and babies to this stuff it's what what happened to us where did we lose our way and our our sense of right and wrong i mean we're insane right now we're out of control all of us we're out of control and we are getting our ass kicked right now because of it pardon my french well i didn't also that didn't include the fishes which is even more than 65 billion correct uh, that. uh so yeah it has to we have to have changes or it's going to crash you know the law the laws of ecology dictate that if any of these laws are violated for a period of time, then there will be a crash. Now, take a look at every major extinction event in the history of this planet. We're now in what's called the sixth major extinction event called the Anthropocene because we're responsible for it. Uh, the most serious was the Permian extinction 250 million years ago, wiped out 97% of everything in the sea and 75% of everything on land. Uh, and what all of those things were primarily caused was excessive greenhouse gas emissions. In those cases, coming from uh, from uh, volcanoes, uh, burning Siberian coal deposits, and uh, asteroid media, asteroid collisions with the Earth, and that. But it's the same thing. What we're doing right now is actually the same. If you look at the beginning of the of the Permian period and where we are right now, it's almost the same amount of greenhouse gases gases that are being released as in the early days of the Permian, and yeah. So we're, we're really there. Now, when people say don't get, get depressed, I said no, because one thing I also learned about all of these major extinction events is that it took about 18 to 20 million years for full recovery. So 18 to 20 million years from now, it's going to be a very nice planet here. We're just not going to be here. <laughs> this is Our timing on planet was the wrong time. <laughs> this, is not, this is not about saving the planet Earth. This is about saving ourselves from our yeah. own stupidity. Yeah. Uh, and that the planet's going to do just fine. Yeah, yeah, with or with, it'll do way better without us, is what I say. So you know, you um, you, you've got a, a documentary called Watson. You've had TV fame with with Whale Wars, raising awareness and all that. Um, will you be doing any TV in your near future? Are you going to be writing books? What what are you, what do you have in the pipeline right now in your crazy busy life of being amazing, Paul Watson? 
well, I have two books published this month. One that's in French, but it's on um, climate change. And the other one is Orcopedia, which uh, uh, it's just being released this month. And that's a, a history of all the all the orca captures and the, and the and the conditions of the orcas today. Are the you know how many people are realize that it's been over 550 orcas have died in the captivity industry. Yeah. And, so I'm just wanting to get people to be aware of just how extensive this is and how cruel this whole uh, industry is. And uh, my book on climate change is, uh, I've got two books on climate change. One is the one that's being published in French and the other one, which is in English, is called Dealing with Climate Change and Stress and how you know how to, uh, to deal with it. And so those are the, the things I'm working on. But we're also doing a, a series on TV on Planet X uh, and uh, we'll be doing more on Discovery. Uh, and, oh, good. Yeah, and our film Watson is now on uh, in on Amazon and other things, and uh, uh, Chasing the Shadows is on National Geographic, and uh, uh, I mean, Sea of Shadows is on National Geographic, and Chasing the the Thunder, uh, it'll be shown in China actually uh, next month. So that that's really amazing. well, that that's good. It, it might open eyes and open hearts and and minds to s new things. You know what I mean? Instead of being kind of like in this fixated mode of whatever they're doing right now, which I can't even describe. But um, so let me ask you one other thing. Um, so I had a thought about, um, you know, the future of like where Sea Shepherd goes and are you are you out on the boats a lot now? Are you more behind the scenes, just kind of running everything, or like, are you where are you in this whole thing? Oh, I'm not on the boats much now because uh, Japan has me on the Interpol red list. <laughs> uh, for, <laughs> but Interpol, you guys have best friends. The Interpol red list was set up to uh, you know for war criminals, serial killers, and major drug dealers. I'm the only person in history the Interpol red list to be put on there for a conspiracy to trespass on a whaling ship. Uh, but this is their way of keeping them from traveling. Well, we'll, we'll get it. To, uh, we'll get it off at some point. But uh, meanwhile, I mean, this is what I was illustrating when I, you know, Japan tried to take me out personally and tried to shut down Sea Shepherd in the U.S. But what they discovered is that it's not me and it's not an organization. It's a movement. They're not going to be That's able. That's right. To. That's right. And you know, I have to tell you, anybody, if if you if you have a chance, you've got to see the footage of like whale wars and stuff to see. Like you are in the midst, you're mixing it up with other ships. And this is the way sometimes you're pushed to do this kind of stuff in order to protect something, you know, like you said, aggressive nonviolence. I mean, you guys are, you know, right in there, you're ramming, you're driving people away from their mission. And um, it, it is, you are putting your life literally on the line. You are walking the walk, talking the talk, and it is it is riveting. You can't turn away from it. Um, you know, you've lived it and you've experienced it. And, uh, you know, it it's inspiring. It's really inspiring. And, you know, I'm glad that, you know, you still have a lot of stuff going on and you're just kind of overseeing Sea Shepherd and where they're going in the direction and all that. And I do have one quick question for you because this also is going to cater to people, to smaller foundations and people trying to get underway. Where, where did the, where did the funding come? How did you get going and, and, and where did you find your sources of funding from? Because a lot of, like I said, a lot of great organizations are in jeopardy right now. If you were giving advice to an up and coming foundation, um, what what could be a takeaway that somebody like, oh, I never thought about that, or I'm going to try try that. Is there anything that you remember doing when you were just starting to raise awareness or get sponsors or anything like that? Well, you have to be incredibly patient. It takes time uh, to get your message uh, message across. So in the early days of Sea Shepherd, we didn't have any money for years and years and years. We just yeah. went from, you know, we went hand to mouth on all of these things. When I first took uh, my uh, ship, the Sea Shepherd uh, 2, to Siberia in 1981, we only got there because every crew member put in $1,000 each for fuel, you know? Oh, and, I love uh, it. But, uh, but so, so we've, you know, we've grown slowly. We could be much bigger, but the reason what we're not is that we didn't, we don't invest into direct mail or fundraising or things like that. It's a, my attitude is that if people want to protect this planet, they can come to us and support us, but we're not going to go begging for money. And we've mm -hmm. never done it. And so all of our support comes is, our, is from people coming to us, not us going, going to them. Because some of these big foundations or groups, they'll spend 75% of everything they bring in on trying to bring in more. And, uh, you know, which really goes into the hundreds of millions of dollars 
uh, which are going to the advertising and fundraising and lawyers and accountants and everything like that. We've wanted to avoid that all through our history. And, and we have. It's kept us small, but it's also kept us uh, probably still the most active group around. I'm glad you brought that up because I, my my running joke with everybody is I said, if if I had the the calendar budget of some of these organizations, I'll get like 12 calendars from the same group. I'm like, if I had that budget, I would have Africa dialed in just off of their calendar budget alone. I get it. So I appreciate organizations because we pride ourselves on being very efficient, making a dollar stretch to $20 because you have to. So that's encouraging that you went through these, you know, challenging times and, you know, you're in it, but that even after all these years, you aren't in a, in that fat cat category where you're like, oh yeah, we're going to spend here and mail out here and all that stuff that you're still lean and mean and just getting the job done. And you're letting your message and your accomplishments speak for you out there. I think, I think it's very important to remain small and active on that. And uh, once your organization gets taken over by accountants and lawyers, well, you're pretty much useless. Yeah. That. And that's, so, get out. you know, you have to always be on guard uh, for that kind of thing. Yeah, no, I get it. And um, is there anything else you'd like to uh, share uh, with our followers and our listeners? Uh, uh, any message, anything else that you're working on that I might not be aware of that we can pass along? Well, I think that, uh, you know, people should understand that each and every one of us has the power to make a difference. You just have to harness your passion to encourage your imagination and go for it and not be deterred by criticism and uh, figure out what it is that you like to do and what are your skills. And, uh, you know, whether it's that approach be legislation or education or litigation or direct action, it all it all works towards the same end. It's really the secret of putting what you do well in the service of making this a better world. And uh, in that way, every one of us can make a difference. And also, don't be deterred by the odds against you. You know, uh, when people say, oh, it's just impossible, you know, there's just no way we can win. Well, you know, the solution to impossible problems is to find the impossible answer. And that is possible. The very idea in 1972 that Nelson Mandela would become president of South Africa was unthinkable. It was impossible. And yet it became possible. And that's the kind of attitude I think that we should all uh, uh, take on is that we can do anything if we really set our mind to it. And there shouldn't be any limitations. I think that that message right there, there's somebody listening and that just reached them and inspired them. And who knows that what you just said right there may be the next world changer out there. You know, they might be the person who figures out how to take plastic out of the ocean. You just never know. You just never know. And I'm I'm so grateful for the time. I again I was really thrilled to to find out that we were going to get to talk and I was going to be able to share your message and and everything you're doing. I hope we get to stay in touch. You know when you've got something coming up or you want to let people know about if you've got an event or you're going to be somewhere. Um, this is your resource. This is what I'm here for. Just to shine a light on you and put it out there in the universe and make it a better place and. And God bless you for your hard work. Thanks for taking those blows. I know people have been hard on you. It's been challenging. Hey, you're wanted by Japan. I mean, enough said right there in, in Interpol. But you know what? You stood your ground. You believed in something. And you're like, you know what? I'm doing the right thing. So whatever it takes, I'm going to do. So an absolute pleasure. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Oh, great. Again, Captain Paul Watson, and uh, I always call him the voice of the ocean, our special guest here on Coexist. So thank you so much. If you want some more information, go to seashepherd.org. You can always email me at co, C-O-E, at nasefu, N-S-E-F-U dot org. I can pass along a message to him, but uh, we appreciate your time. And thanks for the support of the show. I love it. It's, uh, it's for awareness of the world, make it a better place. So Captain Paul, have a great weekend. Thanks so much. We'll talk soon. Thanks. Okay, bye.